All right, so thanks for coming out to the last uh, NSM colloquium this semester. Um, there are two sign-up sheets going around, so make sure you sign up um, if you have to be here for a class. Tonight we have Rick Tivis, who has a master's in public health from the University of Oklahoma. And he has been at ISU for 15 years now in Meridian and has also worked with the VA in Boise as well as the Idaho Center for Health Research. And he's here to talk to us about when randomization is not an option. Thank you. Just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I am a biostatistician. Uh, my master's is in public health, which means that I study basically applied statistics, but also epidemiology and environmental health. So it kind of all came together there. Uh, just, I ended up, I, I was at the University of Oklahoma for 15 years. There I worked in an active research lab that was funded by the National Institute of Health. In particular, the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse. And for the first 15 years of this career, I basically did research on chronic substance abusers looking at cognitive functioning, uh, working with a Dr. Sarah Nixon, who's an experimental psychologist. So it really, I had the opportunity to learn statistics while working in an applied lab. So I could actually bring the data over and apply it. This is, I have about, uh, my presentation I think is around, you know, probably 25 to 30 minutes long. But if you have any questions about biostats, I really think now that you've seen a couple of us, because Todd was here not too long ago, you're starting to get the idea that we are really the cool mathematicians <laughs> of the bunch. Okay. So this really comes out of my work with the VA. Yeah. And I do. I work, uh, currently I'm working with the VA. As a statistician, you end up kind of selling parts of your time to different organizations. So. For 47% of my time, I'm down at the VA. Uh, I also do work with St. Luke's Hospital. I work with a research group there. Uh, we have a group that that is looking at children with chronic medical disorders. And I have two postdocs that work under me in this program as we explore kind of ways of, of how to, to care for these individuals, how to coordinate care, and how care coordination works. Um, I'm involved with a lot of the research that goes on at ISU. I have done everything from, <laughs> from, from alcohol research to, I even had an opportunity a couple of years ago to do some potato research, which I thought was really cool in Idaho. I should do that. So the, the bread and butter of, of kind of research are these randomized controlled trials. So the idea that that we randomize how we assign our groups. Now, as I said, the first 15 years of my research was in alcoholism, and we never did any randomized trial there because you can't randomize people to be alcoholics or not. So there's some research that you cannot do, but it's kind of the epitome, it's what we're shooting for. But there are lots of cases, especially in health research, where we just can't do it. So this is a method that, that I came that I worked on uh, at the VA on a particular project that we had. So the project uh, at the VA, I'm part of the Center for Excellence in Primary Care Education. And what this center is one of, it was one of five original centers in the nation that, that was trying a program and evaluating how to educate healthcare professionals in an interprofessional environment. So you have physicians who are trained in their silo. We have pharmacists trained in their silo and psychologists trained in their silo. And we bring them together in the clinic and try to think about how to best provide integrated care. We know that integrated care works really well, but how do we train these individuals to do it? So I was brought in as part of the evaluation component of this. So one of the things that came out of it, we did a lot of workplace learning. So a lot of where they were actually having to work together. One of the things that we did was an interprofessional case conference. And that's what we're trying to evaluate in this. So basically, I want to talk about randomization. And randomization never happens on the dodgeball court. So it's the idea that 
rarely do you get a randomly assigned to a dodgeball team. I never got picked very early. So as we talk about these randomized controlled trials, one of the things that, you know, as, as healthcare professionals, we have to, in really any science, you're evaluating the evidence. So what does the evidence look like for a particular therapy? What does the evidence look like for a particular drug? And when you look at the literature to see the evidence, there's kind of a pyramid as to how strong the evidence is. So we really value things that are out of randomized controlled trials as being at the peak of the pyramid. But like I said, you can't always do randomized controlled trials. The only thing really above them are systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. So you can't always you can't always randomize when you have things like when you look at a disease state. So you can't really assign somebody to have a disease. You can't assign somebody for alcoholism. You can't assign somebody to be a, a child with complex medical disorders. So how do we examine those kinds of things? So why is the R so important? Why do we want to randomize? Guys, have any thoughts? Think about the, the dodgeball court. Why would we want to let randomly pick? Pardon? Yeah, so you're trying to reduce bias. You're trying to reduce some kind of selection bias that's going on. Uh, so something that maybe I know that this person is a particular is a better player. So I have some inside information. So if I randomize, then I reduce bias. Now, a lot of our mathematical formulas that we use in statistics have this assumption and really, really kind of count on this randomization. So it's really, what we're talking about is it's all about control. And in research, we're trying to control as much as possible. So one of the ways of controlling that bias is to randomize. There are lots of other things that you can do, but that's one of the ways. So when I was in Oklahoma and we were doing research with alcoholics, uh, we were doing neuropsych testing on these alcoholics and we would spend, uh, spend a half a day really with them testing them and a lot of psychosocial interviewing. There's a bias, there's a bias in how people will answer depending on the sex of the person that's doing the, asking the questions. So if it's the same sex or a different sex. So the way we try to reduce that is we would random, randomize who the interviewer was because we had male and female interviewers. We'd also try to, to lower that influence by kind of dressing the same. So we had lab coats that we wore. So we had this kind of uh, same look about it. But it's really about controlling. So with, without randomization, what we're doing is we begin to introduce bias. And it really hurts our ability to attribute our cause. So uh, what we're trying to do with research generally is looking for some kind of causal relationship, trying to sort it out. Now, I would say more than that, because when I, when I talk about research in the, in the class I teach, research is also, you know, it's the way of building your evidence to change the system. But you have to have strong evidence that connects to your cause. So dropping the randomization, you lose a little bit of the control you're possibly introducing bias, which hurts our ability to, to attribute the cause to the intervention. There's also the fact that you know, if, I don't, if I don't have randomization, then I'm going to have to pick my control group. And in picking my control group, you know, that can introduce bias too. I mean, there's really... I've heard it said that if you let me pick the control group, I can guarantee you statistical significance. 
because I can find the group that, that is the farthest different. Yes? If you were worried about it being biased by men or women, so you were randomizing who got to interview them, um, what if you were to um, remotely interview them with a computerized voice instead of with a person? That would be one way to do it, depending on, but you might, you're going to lose, you might lose some of that relationship that you've built with this person over the several days of picking them up, and you might lose some honesty. So even if you had a camera to see the reaction, that's yeah. understandable. Yeah. So if I can just kind of, if I can control for, for that by randomizing, then that helps without losing what I'm trying to do. So if, you, if you've got a design, you're really looking at this, this particular thing, in the, this case, this case conference, and what I'd like to know is, are the patients benefiting from this, this interprofessional case conference? <coughs> Because that's that's the meat of the situation. So are they benefiting? Then you call in the statistician to help you help you think about it. Because in my bag of tricks, I have multiple designs. So lots of different ways that we can we can set the study up to be able to look at the results and to tease out where you want to go. So that's one of the things that I always try to stress the importance of is bringing a statistician in early. I forgot to bring my video. I should link to that. Send you guys a link to that. So randomized controlled trials are really just kind of a small piece of the designs that we can use. So what we want to do is to look at this from the tools we have our toolbox and try to, to pick a design and pick the controls in a fair way. So this is, like I said, this is what we call the PACT ICU. PACT is just an acronym at the VA. The VA loves acronyms. So it's just an acronym for uh, basically the patient cared, the patient centered medical home. So and that's what we're training these guys. The ICU, we just thought that was cute, but it was interprofessional case something. <laughs> uh, but it's interprofessional case conference. So what we do, is we have these students, we have residents, and we have nurse practitioners who are in this clinic. And we have an interprofessional case conference where they can present one of their patients. And in the case conference, we have social work, we have pharmacy there, we have psychology there, we have nursing there, uh, sometimes a chaplain comes in, and we also have uh, physician faculties and nurse practitioner faculty. So all the those people around the table, we present the case conference to them. <coughs> what we need is a, is a patient that's medically complex. And that's one of the things that we have a lot of out of the VA. We have patients that are very complex and very sick. So it's a high priority for the VA. So what, the way we deal, the way we set this up, you know, and again, there's always kind of these trade-offs. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, we could do it with a computer-generated, you know, de degenderized uh, boys, but there's always trade-offs. You always have to think of these trade-offs. So, we have this case conference. We would like the providers to be engaged in this process. So part of what we're doing is giving them a choice of who to present. Now that automatically is introducing a bias. But the physician who was spraying this felt it was important that they had the opportunity to do that. So what we have is we have a, a, a score out there in the VA. And the, score, the VA has an amazing medical, electronic medical record. It has all kinds of algorithms that people have calculated in there. One of them is called the CAN score, and it represents the probability of dying or being hospitalized in the next six months. So it's a way to look at your patients who are the sickest and who are most likely to have some kind of crisis coming up pretty quickly. So 
what we did was we provided for the trainee who was going to present in the next week the patients that had the highest CAN scores. So here are your top five patients. You get to pick which one to present. So that, that introduces choice that we're going to have to deal with somewhere along the line. But it also, you know, it strengthens the interprofessional case conference because the, the providers engage and they're not just presenting on somebody we told them to present on. Uh, also, there's, you know, there's, maybe the CAN score is calculated on the previous six months worth of data. So there's a possibility that somebody may be getting better and they feel like there's not a need, even though they still have as high CAN score. Or there's somebody could be just under hospice care, you know, is the reality of it too. So that, that the case conference is not going to benefit them a whole lot either. So what happens is the trainee gets to pick the patient that they think would benefit the most from this to present. The patient is contacted, and I believe psychology was doing this, at least for a portion of it. So the patient, they would contact the patient because one of the things that's very important in this, uh, this patient-centered medical home is the patient's perspective. So they would contact the patient to get their perspective. Then all this would be presented to the interprofessional group. By the end of the group presentation, they would come up with a, I mean, they would have, they would know all their medications are on, they would know everything, they'd be able to hear from nursing care, and they would come up with a plan and divide up who would implement it. So it truly was an interprofessional effort. So they come up with this multi-professional care plan with shared assignments. So because this is part of our training program, with everything we're doing, we have dual goals. We have the goal that, that our educational process is, is working. So they're becoming more integrated. They're learning more about the other professions, learning how to work together as a team. They're increasing knowledge of each other. And then the other goal is always the patient that we hope, we hope the patient is, is doing better as a result of whatever we do. Minimally, we hope that our, because this is a training clinic, it's not performing any worse than the other clinics. So you always have these different, different kind of goals that are going on. So with, with these patients, these are mainly, uh, these are very sick individuals a lot of heart disease, a lot of diabetes going on. So we're looking at the healthcare record. Uh, one of the main things we're interested in is utilization. So how are they utilizing the system? And we kind of classify things as, as uh, well, when we talked about it, we talked about it as bad utilization versus good utilization, but it's really improper utilization. So the idea that they wait until they have to go to the ER, or this wasn't caught before, they had to go to the ER or they had to go to the hospital. Good utilization would be in your primary care clinic. So maybe we would expect with this interprofessional case conference that actually the primary care visits, in particular, the touches from other members of the primary care team, from the nurse, from the uh, pharmacy, from the social work and psychology, might increase for a while. But we would hope that they would decrease their ER visits in their hospitalizations. Uh, this is not in the slide, but do you guys, do you guys understand the problem with any kind of research where you're picking the most sick individuals or, or the extremes? Yeah, you're kind of looking at the outliers. What's going to happen to the outliers if you do nothing? 
Well, they're either more likely to die or they're more likely to get better. They're probably not going to stay at that, that level. So you have this thing that we talk about as regression to the mean. You know, that if, if I pick the sickest individuals, the ones with the highest A1C level, which is a measure of diabetes, then, you know, if I do nothing, they may come down anyway. <laughs> They're going to kind of regress. So you kind of have to battle that piece. But what we have is we have, that they have five people that they picked for, from. We know these five people were all fairly, you know, pretty sick. They were at the high range of their CAN score. So we have at that particular time. So on that, that particular two week period that they were looking at this, we had four other individuals that were also their patients in the same clinic that were sick. So we really have somebody that we can pick a control from. So which control do you pick? So this was the problem that was kind of called in to solve. And we can do gender matching. We can kind of match them on age. We can probably kind of match them on disease state. I mean, we have that information. It gets a little trickier, but we could do that. So that was kind of our initial idea. So we're going to pick a control from the same day that's about the same age and the same gender. And what we want to look at, because we have because we have this massive database, and we can go back and we can cut this data however we want. We can look at it retrospectively. We can pull, you know, a year's worth of data. What we would like is during the baseline period, so prior to the intervention, we would like them to be kind of the same. So when we just balance on on age and gender, then looking at that before the intervention period. We still had differences. So we had to kind of think about, okay, so what do we do with that? We still have differences. We'd like to have these be about the same. Now, we could, one approach would simply be to, to mathematically account for this pre-data and adjust, and adjust it down. So that's one of the things we do. We call that covariance. So, co-varying for their previous performance, but that's still not going to be still not going to be picking as good a control as we can. So, what factor? I mean, if it's not age and gender and disease state, what is left that's the difference between the controls that the provider picked and the controls that we picked? It's that the provider picked them. So, you know, the, the, the physician or the NP, they had a choice as to who they wanted to pick. So they eliminated people that were on hospice that we didn't necessarily know about. Also, I mean, who are you going to pick? You're probably going to pick the one that was in the office the most lately bugging you. So the one that you're most familiar with. So if that's the bias that's in, in the data, can we control for that? So choice enters the picture. So can we model the trainee's choice? And that's what we're talking about is building a mathematical model of choice. So Basically, what we did is we look, looked at the data prior to the intervention at the point of choice and tried to, to build a model for that. And when I talk about a model, uh, we talk about that a lot in, in uh, statistics, the computational sciences, they talk about a lot. They're, they're big model builders. I talk about them as algorithms. Uh, but statisticians, we've been doing models for a long time, <laughs> just to say. So, what we did was we built a model. And in a model, what we're talking about is some kind of predictive line. Now, generally, uh, you know, in a mathematical model, it's pretty straightforward. You have the equation for the line, 
And that's what we're trying to build is this equation. So it has an intercept, it has a slope in a straight line sense. The difference in what we're doing is we're actually trying to build a line, a model for a line that's more curved like this. So we'll have a logit kind of curve to it. And that's just for the mathematical guys. So what we did was we changed the outcome of the variable as to was the patient picked or not. So it becomes a binary outcome. For a statistician, in deciding what analysis to do, that's the kind of information that comes in. What is my outcome and what kind of variable is it? Well, if it's a binary outcome, and I have these other factors that I want to put into it, it just really works well with the logistic regression. So I can do a logistic regression to model this outcome, a picked or not. And I really think that it's exposure. I think that's the, the big piece, that they know that their patient went to the ER because they're getting, they're getting alerts on that. They know that their patient's in the hospital. They know when the patient's been calling. So I really think it's that prior utilization that I can build a model from there to predict the outcome of choice. So the logistic regression is, is really one of our cooler tools. <laughs> I really like it. Uh, so they use it a lot in medicine. Medicine really favors the logistic regression. So anytime that you hear the, the uh, people say, and epidemiology does too, they say you're at twice the risk of developing a certain kind of cancer if you eat bacon. They've used a logistic regression. So you're seeing it behind the scenes a lot in your data. Anytime they talk about increased risk, generally they've used a logistic because they've also controlled for some other factors. And it just bodes well with that. So the thing about the logistic regression is it builds this nice equation. I can use the data from that particular patient, plug it into the equation, and get a score, which will be a propensity score. So it's a likelihood that they will be picked. So now we're modeling choice of the provider. I can model how likely it is that a particular individual would be picked. If it works well, so it becomes like this. Each person in there has a score. And I would expect that the scores of the ones that were picked would be higher than the, the ones that weren't picked. And that was, that was true for the case. So I run the logistic regression on the total population, on all of them picked and non-picked. I modeled whether they're the choice, built the equation, then pumped their data through the equation so that I could get this propensity score. Then what I could do is take and pick for the control the person with the highest likelihood of being chosen that wasn't chosen. which I got really excited about. <laughs> you guys like the, you guys look like the doctors I talked to. <laughs> they weren't as excited about it, but I was excited about it. So, I mean, the big thing is, does it work? So, if we do this, do we get controls that are in that prior utilization functioning about at the same rate as the ones in the after, that were picked. And sure enough, they were. Uh, the controls are in the blue, and the, the patients who were in the treatment uh, in the ICU, the packed ICU, are in red. And you'll notice that their team visits are climbing, both of them. Again, that's not surprising. This is four to six months prior. This is two months prior. This is right at the intervention. So it, what's going on is what we think, and that these are patients that are being seen in the clinic more often.
and at least showing up. The same thing with the PC bits. But you can also see that the lines really are not that far apart. So we're talking about in the two-month period, uh, this, is, this is the number of visits they had in the two-month period. So about one and a half visits over the two months. It's average. Going up to around two. Hospitalizations were pretty flat. The lines like, and none of these were significantly different. So it's kind of a different way of using statistics to, you know, to pick a control that's a good solid control. We've, we've published on this now. Um, what I've spent 20 minutes talking about, we used in two lines of the paper, <laughs> which is kind of the way it goes for statisticians. But uh, yeah. So it's kind of cool work. The idea that we can use propensity scores are being used more often, especially when we can't do randomized trials. If I can, if I can pick a control based on these kind of probabilities, so that they're they're very much like them, then it's kind of a better way to go. So that's what I, the exciting information I have about propensity scores. I do lots of different kinds of research. I think that's the thing that I like about being a statistician. So I'll give you my pitch about being a statistician. Besides it being cool, is that, uh, well, Tukey says it best. Tukey says that, that the cool thing about being a statistician is we get to play in everybody's backyard. So I get to learn a little bit about all these different fields. You know, so if I'm working with a potatoes researcher, I'm finding out that they actually store these potatoes in barrels and they're testing different chemicals on them to see how long they can keep them and how, you know, what's the best way to keep them the longest. Uh, you know, I learned about these, uh, I'm particularly passionate about these, these people with complex medical disorders and how we care for them. This is a huge cost to the system, you know, whether it's the children or whether it's uh, at the VA and how we deal with that. So it's, it's really also a way of kind of, of, of moving, moving the needle, empowering change. So does anybody have any questions? Yes? How do you test your models to see if you're good? So there, when you get into the multivariate world, which we are when we're talking about logistic regression, there are several different indices that we can use for testing the model. So it was a significant model to start with. Uh, once we plugged it in there, we had a significant model, and we had actually used like a C, a C statistic is what we used on the tell. But there are usually like two or three different ones you can use, and you look across all of them to decide. So it's really, it's, it's interesting because when you get into, when you've done the, the basic stats, so the t-test, the ANOVA, things are pretty straightforward. Once you move into the multivariate world, which is where things, human research ends up, it gets very complicated and there are, there are lots of different choices on how to look at it. So different approaches in different ways, usually there's like four or five different tests that you can look at. Yeah, I saw that your equations had those beta terms in there. Mm -hmm. So do you eliminate beta terms and see which ones are useful and which ones aren't? Right, you can. You can evaluate each beta. So you can evaluate each thing that went into the equation. In this case, we're talking about including uh, utilization. So hospitalizations, uh, ER visits, I could count those up. Uh, PAC team visits, so that's visits with a nurse or anybody in the team, and PC visits. So I plugged all of those into the equation, and I could evaluate each element of that equation to see if it was, if it contributed statistically significantly to the model, or what its contribution was. It gets, it's not quite as clean as in the linear regression, because in the linear regression we actually have an R squared, so we can talk about the proportion of the variance accounted for by this individual item. 
In logistic, it's a little messier, but it's still the same kind of principle. So we can evaluate which ones, uh, all three, all four of those were fine, so we just plugged them all in. So you thinking about statistics, or? It, yes. Okay. I'm just curious what um, statistical software packages that you use and what you like and what you don't like. And uh, I started out in Oklahoma in uh, a computer lab there, or in this research lab, and we were running SAS on the mainframe. Mm -hmm. So I have stuck with SAS all along. Uh, in my private consulting, it's a little pricey to stick with it. Uh, you know, for academics, they, you can use it for a class for free. So I, I like SAS, uh, and I write code for how to do it. So it gives me a little more flexibility. I'm not as much on the button pushing kinds of software, just because uh, usually what I have to do is I have to repeat the analysis. So I'm tweaking and I'm repeating, and so if I just have the code, then I can just do that. Yeah. Uh, if I'm outside that, I really like Jump, JMP. It's also a SaaS product. Mm -hmm. It's less expensive, and I've used it in the classroom. I was using SPSS in the classroom, um, and I switched to JMP because the university bought a site license, so whatever. So I switched over to it. I really found it was more intuitive and that the students were picking up, you know, as I went through that first round, they were telling me stuff that they were picking up with it. I also like that we always tell people, you know, what you're looking at you is to look at your data. <laughs> you know, look at your data. I, I'll tell you another story of what happens when you don't do that. But look at your data. Job, the first display it gives you is a display of the data. So if you're doing a correlation, it's going to give you a scatter plot. Then you go through and you can kind of decide, well, do I need to do a correlation with Pearson or, or a non parametric one? But I like that. So the story about looking at your data, like I said, I worked in this laboratory in Oklahoma, and we were a powerhouse laboratory. So we had, uh, Joey had a, one to two doctoral students in there. We had three full-time research assistants working on these projects. These were million dollar projects. Um, we had, sometimes we had a postdoc in there. So, we had decent funding, so we were always going to the conference. We have a conference we go to, the Research Society on Alcoholism, which was kind of the, the conference for that, that group, which astounded me the first time I went there and found out how much they drank at that conference. But, it seemed a little weird, but that, that's science. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like I said, we're, we're cranking out these. We get ready to go for the conference, and to be able to go to the conference, you have to have a poster that you're taking. So we can find funding for you, but you need to take a poster. So we have all this data we're collecting, and we collect a huge amount of data because... We're uh, basically screening at a treatment center, at actually four treatment centers. Uh, we screen at two, three of them every week. Everybody that comes in, so anybody that came into treatment in Oklahoma City saw us. So we did a screening packet there, which had a, uh, a depression inventory. It had a verbal IQ inventory. It had a history of alcoholism, so a family tree of alcoholism and substance abuse. Uh, it had other kinds of measures. Let's see what else we have. Oh, we had measures of their alcohol use, how much they drank, and how much they used. Uh, that we would use this to calculate. That was just from the screen. We would bring them into the laboratory, and we'd do a half day of uh, electrophysiology which produces a ton of data, because we were collecting on, uh, towards the end we were collecting on 64 sites, collecting every two, two milliseconds. So, 
a lot of data. And then the, re the second half of the day, we did neuropsych testing. So we had a lot of neuropsych tests. So we collected a lot of data. Our main question was kind of overarching, but we had a lot of these little side projects that you could look at. So we go and, you know, it's, it's, time, for the, it's time for the abstracts for RSA. So everybody's cranking out abstracts. I'm helping with a lot of the stats on the abstracts. So I'm helping with them. Okay, I've got to do one myself. So I look at the relationship, and I don't remember what it even was. Uh, but it was some kind of correlational analysis, straightforward. Just there's a relationship, and more than likely it was uh, age of onset. That was kind of one of my favorite ones, looking at age of onset of drinking in some, some measure. So I do this. It's significantly correlated. You know, if you write an abstract, you're talking about a paragraph kind of with one sentence, two sentences on your results, so not a big deal. Crank this out, put it together, it's fine. Well, then it gets accepted because pretty much all of our stuff got accepted every time. Um, so now I've got to do the poster. So I do the poster, okay. It's not as cool just to say that, hey, there was a significant correlation. You kind of need to do a scatter plot or something that shows, maybe with a line showing what the relationship looked like. I had said it was a positive or negative relationship. So I go and I look at this thing, and when I graph it out, what I see is a cluster of dots about this big around with no shape to it. So the idea with the correlation is you should be able to see a line. I don't see a line. I see a ball here. And I see one guy up here that has pulled my correlation up and made it significant. Yeah, <laughs> look at your data. <laughs> and that's what I like about JMP is it does just, it brings it up and looks at it. Because if you click that guy with, with uh, the new software, now you can click him and say, hey, exclude this guy, it's sticking out. You know, and it could be that, that Gene, our research assistant, just screwed up the data. You know, it could be anything. But you can drop that guy out and then evaluate your correlation and see that, oh, gee, it goes away. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, lots of different stuff. It, it really was kind of cool that I could actually work on the MPH, you know, cross the parking lot, then come back over and apply things. Although I would say that one of the hardest posters I did was I came over and I learned the school analysis. We had some data that, that made sense to try it on, and I tried it on that. Then kind of doing that backwards, building your introduction and why you did this. <laughs> you can't say, I just did it because <laughs> I knew how to do this new thing. <laughs> but yeah, it was really, it was kind of cool. And there are lots of really cool questions that I've been able to answer and work with. Uh, one particular one that was kind of fun was my wife's dissertation. My wife is a, is a PhD biological psychologist, so she's just way smarter than I am. And in her, her defense, at the time, there were three hypotheses of how alcohol damaged your brain, chronic alcohol abuse damaged your brain. One was that it pretty much just pickles the whole thing, so you get these deficits across all areas. There was also one, that, and I never can get the hemispheres right, but I think it was like a right hemisphere hypothesis, so it really damaged your it preferentially damages your ability to, to think abstractly. And we know that alcoholics have problems with abstraction. There was also a frontal lobe hypothesis. So in the front of the brain, I do remember this, is, um, is involved in executive functioning, so decision making. We know alcoholics make poor decisions. So the idea that that was a preference. That maybe, you know, so there was three different competing hypotheses. And my wife presented on this kind of mild generalized hypothesis. And one of the, the professors who could be a little quirky anyway was saying that, yeah, but you know, if you're collecting all this data with these different hypotheses, isn't it possible that because we're dealing with averages that it's always going to look like a mild generalized? Suppose we have some people who have you know, preferential frontal lobe damage or preferential uh, right hemisphere damage. You know, we average them together, maybe there are different ones. 
So because I'm in this lab that had been there for a long time and we've been collecting data for a long time, what we were able to do is, and I work with a bunch of neuropsychologists, which has its advantages and disadvantages, but we were able to decide these tests, this set of tests measures frontal lobe function, executive functioning. This set of tests kind of really measures abstraction skills. And these are just kind of other tests. The vocabulary, those kinds of things. So we had this battery of tests and we were able to do what they call a cluster analysis. So uh, it's not something you, you see very often. Although I think the biological sciences used, uses it some in uh, classification. So looking at patterns of like teeth for uh, classifying different mammals and stuff. So what we did was put all this in with this group of alcoholics, and if he was right, then what we would expect was to see a cluster that had preferential frontal lobe executive functioning damage. So they had deficits there. Or we might see a group, a cluster there that just really had abstraction, but were okay with vocabulary and other things, and maybe with executive functioning. What we saw was as it went down, and there, there's ways to evaluate this, there's, there's plots that you have to look at and decision points you have to make as to how many clusters you get. It basically loaded into one big cluster that just did poorly on everything. Just slightly down on all different measures. So it's a way, you know, we really get to look at a lot of cool different kinds of questions. And for me, I'm, I'm more of an applied statistician, so I'm not I'm not, I'm not going to develop any new stat procedures. There's not going to be a, a TIVIS test. Uh, but I get, I'm a, applied. So when I find a cool problem, I'm able to go to the literature and try to see how different people approach this, see what the latest techniques are. I'm a member of the American Statistical Association, so I can look through our literature and find the technique that worked, which is how I came across this propensity score stuff. But then, then I just kind of play and figure out how to do it. Any other questions for Rick? No? Thank you for speaking to me.